Very good evening, learned panelists, esteemed moderators, and participants. It is my distinct distinct pleasure to introduce the panel for this evening. The discussion would be moderated by Attorney at Law, Mrs. Faisa Mustafa Maka, who is an attorney at law of the Supreme Court of Colombo, senior counsel practicing in the appellate courts of Sri Lanka, primary in the area of fundamental rights, in brief matters, commercial law, and public interest litigation. She is also a former lecturer uh, at the Open University and Royal Institute of Colombo, Sri Lanka. She experienced interesting investment on behalf of the investors and the Board of Investment in Sri Lanka, with special emphasis on mega and large scale infrastructure projects. She is accompanied by attorney at law, Ms. Tushani Machado, who is herself an attorney at law of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. Practicing in the appellate courts of Sri Lanka, primarily in the areas of fundamental rights and commercial law. Our learned panelists for the evening are Dr. Sunil Pure, who is a well renowned legal luminary, the sphere of administrative law in Sri Lanka. He has been in the legal practice for over 55 years. He is the author of the two volumes of authoritative text principles of administrative law in Sri Lanka. He is joined by the president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, President's Council, Mr. Salia Pedis. He has his law members practicing in the area of criminal law, public law, fundamental rights in the appellate court or general court. And he functioned as the first chairman of the Office of Missing Persons from February 2018 to September 2019. He was a member of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka between October 2015 to March 2018. He served as the Deputy President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka from 2015 to 2017 and has been a strong prominent for the strength of the human rights, strong and independent bar in Sri Lanka, rule of law and the independent judiciary. The discussion for this evening is based on the topic of administrative law in Sri Lanka. Before our learned panel proceed with their discussion, allow me to give an insight about the people of Center of S.M. Mustafa Memorial Administrative Law. S.M. Mustafa was a renowned practitioner in Dumbarabha, where is Candy, where he was renowned as the Lion of the Dumbarabha, a call sign designated to him on account of reputation an outstanding member of the Dumbar Bar. Mr. S. M. Mustafa's excellence and integrity was unmatched. The S. M. Mustafa Memorial Administrative Law Moot is the first of its kind moot court competition in Sri Lanka, it's committed to the memory of Mr. S. M. Mustafa, the aim of educating, connecting, running young legal profession aspiring uh, to the practice in the field of administrative. Over to you, uh, Madam Faj. Thank you, Asir. A very good evening to the distinguished panelists and the young participant. The problem for the moot has been launched. We have received numerous questions from our energetic young participants. We are sorry that we are unable to accommodate all the questions due to the time constraint. The subject for discussion is administrative law. But administrative law is a body of law which has developed principles which seeks to ensure that public bodies act in a way which is legal, reasonable, fair, and transparent. It provides a way to challenge maladministration or the misuse or abuse of power by a public body. We are glad to have on board young and fresh minds. Please forgive us if some of the questions appear to be too simple. They are intended to capture the interests of some of our very young participants. Dr. Sunil Kure is a well-known practitioner in administrative law. His monumental work is a great contribution to administrative law in Sri Lanka. It's a guide, it's a guide to judges, lawyers, academics, and students. Mr. Salia Piris, President's Counsel, also the President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, is a household name. He has firmly advocated for good governance and is a giant in the field of administrative law. At the moot, we address the relevant issues. I will now pose the questions to our distinguished panelists so that they will be able to guide the participants. May I proceed to pose the questions to the distinguished panelists? 
Dr. Sunil Pure, sir. What are the circumstances in which a person can invoke the writ jurisdiction under Article 140 of the Constitution? Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Now can you hear me? Is it all yes. right? Yes, sir. Okay, right, right. Uh, I think uh, there are uh, there, there are several writs referred to in Article 140, and in Article 141 refers to habeas corpus. Article 140, the most important writs are the writ of uh, certiorari and also writ of mandamus. But the writ of mandamus, uh, uh, you you are you ask the question when is it available, right? Is that right? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can when are these available? Yes. Sir. Well, certiorari so is available to quash or to set aside. Quash means to set aside and make, a, make it null and void. To quash an exercise of power uh, which is either ultra virus or which contains error of law on the face of the record. Those are the two instances in which the writ of certiorari applies. So a party coming to court seeking to quash some exercise of power which is hurting him or her, must demonstrate to court either it's ultra virus or it contains error of law on the face of the record. Those are the only two grounds. Uh, are also, I'm sorry, a very important ground that uh, there has been a violation of the rules of natural justice. Rules of natural justice. Coming to the writ of mandamus, mandamus uh, in Latin means uh, to uh, to we command, we command, mandamus means we command. We command what? The court commands some officer who has statutory power to exercise his statutory power validly. That is the written mandamus. So written mandamus is available where either power has, been ex has not been exercised at all or where power has been exercised invalidly and the uh, court accepts that position and court orders the power to be exercised validly. Then, of course, there are other writs under Article 140, like uh, writ of prohibition. Prohibition goes hand in hand with certiorari. Right? Certiorari right? look to the past to quash what has been wrongly done, either in violation of natural justice or ultra virus, or containing error of law on the face of the record. And uh, uh, the, the writ of mandamus, as I said, is to command. And uh, prohibition, of course, says you have no power. Don't proceed with this matter. Prohibition. It's an English word, prohibition. And it says you have no power to proceed with this matter. And the court is ordering an officer or a authority not to proceed to exercise the power that they intend to exercise or they're threatening to exercise. So those are the two writs that are connected. That is the writ of certiorari, right, writ of prohibition. Mandamus, uh, I think uh, those are the most important writs under Article 140 of the Constitution. Those are the instances in which it's available. And who can invoke the yeah. restriction of the Court of Appeals? Sir? Well, as far as certiorari uh, is concerned, yes, yes. concern, a party who complains that the power has been exercised either in violation of natural justice or ultra virus or containing error of law on the face of the record can complain and ask that it be quashed. Well, the person who, who comes to court for quashing by certiorari must have an interest in the matter. Long ago, the interest had to be very, very close. The person must be really affected by the excess of power. But now the courts have sort of deviated from that. And they uh, allow people uh, who want to quash invalid excess of power, maybe they are, they, are, they are affected and also the general public are affected. That type of situation also is now permitted by law for a person to come to court to quash. As far as mandamus is concerned, of course, the mandamus has to be applied for by the person who is being hurt because power has been invalidly exercised or power has not been exercised at all. And the court orders him to exercise his power, statutory power, validly or correctly. Those are the instances in which those are the persons who can come to court. 
Mr. Beatties, sir. Mr. Beatties, sir. Uh, we would, along the same lines as Dr. Kure spoke about uh, the uh, interest in an application as to who could invoke. Uh, if you can tell us about the local standard of a Greek person, sir. Sir, we can't, can't hear, hear sir. Yeah, so, so, that, so, so, so I think it would very much depend also on the nature of the case. Now, uh, de depending, uh, there may be certain matters of public interest where mem either members of the public or uh, an organization might be able to come into court. So, for example, we have had cases relating to the environment, wildlife, so on, where different uh, organizations uh, like the Environment Foundation and so on have come in and successfully uh, uh, pursued uh, uh, writ cases. On the other hand, certain matters, uh, you might need to find that the particular person who is affected by an order which is sought to be quashed or uh, by a particular failure to perform a public duty, though the person affected might have to come come to court. So the, the question of sufficient in, interest would also need to have to be judged depending on the nature of the case. So for instance, a case such as uh, the, uh, now there was, you know, that in 2018, there was a case which challenged the appointment of the uh, prime minister, the appointment of uh, 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 of Mr. Mahindra Rajbaksa, the prime minister, not really the appointment, but following a no confidence motion, uh, whether he was entitled to continue. There was a writ of co-warrant of him. Now, a case like that, uh, perhaps any person, any member of the public, any citizen of Sri Lanka would be able to pursue. But if you take, for instance, something like a, an appointment in a government corporation or a dismissal, uh, if you or a school admission, then you, you would not be able to find the, the, a member of the public will not be able to go in you, uh, the particular person who, or the parent who has sufficient interest might have to go in. So I, I think the, uh, the category would be you would have to look at whether your, the organization or whether the person concerned has a sufficient interest to go in. So recently I had a matter where, where some person came to me. They wanted to challenge the removal of a particular officer from a particular institution. But that officer concern was not willing to go into court. But an interest group, uh, this was related to the health sector, wanted to go in. So then the question comes whether actually that other group has sufficient interest in the officer concerned himself is not complaining. Yes, sir. Can you intervene in a pending with application? There are, there are two schools of thought on this. Uh, there is a, there is one school of thought uh, uh, citing certain authorities. I, uh, I think, if I remember right, in the nineteen sixties, where intervention was refused, and it was said that you cannot intervene in a writ application. Then subsequently, I think this there was a divisional bench of the Court of Appeal, a three-judge bench, which upheld that rule and said that you cannot intervene in a in an application in a writ case. Yes. But on the other hand. Uh, despite the three judge decision, you we, we do find in certain cases uh, intervention has been allowed by the court. And uh, we, for instance, the, I think in the Saitam case, the in the Supreme Court intervention was allowed. Supreme Court, which was appealed from a writ. Um, recently, I had a matter in a case where relating to some homeopathy practitioners, where my my clients were not made parties in the court of appeal. Uh, so, but we we filed, uh, we were not parties in the court of appeal, but we were affected by the order of the court of appeal. When we went to the Supreme Court, one of the questions which uh, uh, on which the Supreme Court uh, Supreme Court allowed us to file, uh, granted us special leave to appeal, but also uh, one of the questions was whether we should have been made a part in the original application. So, I think it's a, it's still it is not really settled because in, in certain cases. The, the there is a view that you you should allow because otherwise the court might issue a writ which might adversely affect a party who is not heard. 
But do the rules of the Supreme Court permit interventions? There are no specific, there are no specific <laughs> rules related to intervention. But as a matter of practice, there have has been there ha have been interventions allowed even after that divisional bench decision. Still, uh, the court has in certain cases allowed intervention, and sometimes of course the petitioner also does not object to that the intervention because it is a party which is being affected, which is seeking to intervene. But uh, I also want to say this that the the, the whereas. Uh, uh, it is in, in, in written applications or fundamental rights applications, interventions may be allowed, but in ordinary civil and criminal cases, you cannot have various organizations intervening. I say this because I, I saw recently in a, in a criminal matter, certain organizations are trying to intervene and uh, that is not allowed, would not be allowed. And so in the Supreme Court, in terms of Article 134.3, you have a right to be heard. Need to be heard. Right. So, uh, so, uh, but the question, uh, I, uh, the Supreme Court allows that in certain instances, such as a matter of matters of bills, yes. so on. Yes. But I, I again, I, I do not know whether that right under 134 is an independent right. Okay. 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 Uh, Doctor Kure, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Briefly explain what is encapsulated in the doctrine of ultraviolence. I think you're muted, sir. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you, sir. Okay, right. Uh, it simply means it's two Latin words meaning beyond power. That is to say, somebody has acted not within the power conferred on him by law, but he has gone outside the power. He has no power to do that. It simply means that. That is to say, now, whenever an officer or authority exercises power, that power must ultimately, either directly or uh, indirectly, be, be power conferred or authorized by law, by, by, the, by the actually by the constitution, by the constitution itself. So if the power that is, that is not given to him by law, then what he does or what he purports to do is beyond his power, that is to say is ultra-virus. I think it's not really difficult to understand that concept. What is the effect of an ouster clause in a writ application? Uh, well, writ applications, uh, it depends on the ouster clause. Ouster clauses are different. I mean, uh, in ouster meaning that is to say the jurisdiction of the court is ousted by statute itself. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the one, one type of ouster clause is that uh, whether say uh, an authority is given power to exercise in a certain situation and it says uh, the order or the uh, determination he makes shall be final. Now that is not an ouster clause. The courts have interpreted that not to be an ouster clause. It only means no right of appeal. But there are other ouster clauses, uh, say for instance, uh, shall not be called in question in any court, whether by we are read to otherwise and so on. Now, the way of understanding that is also governed by statute, namely by section 22 of the interpretation ordinance. It says that uh, if uh, that type of ouster clause uh, is uh, very effective as far as uh, the state is concerned, because that really ousts, but there are instances in which, uh, say, uh, uh, shall, I, shall I say, power is given and the exercise of power is ousted, but the interpretation to be placed on that is that if it is validly exercised, uh, its power is ousted. Now, for instance, this case, this question came up uh, long ago, uh, before section, uh, uh, before, sorry, uh, in 1970, uh, in the 1970s, that is to say, uh, the whether the uh, whether the high courts and the district courts could grant interim relief, interim district courts, interim injunctions or in, in, uh, in joining orders and high courts stay orders in respect of land acquisition matters. 
land acquisition matters. If the phrase is uh, that that uh, order for acquisition of land cannot be questioned, but they interpreted they, they, this matter was decided by a bench of nine judges, and they divided five to four. Five judges said that what is contemplated by the law, the ouster, is that only something that has been validly done cannot be called in question. I'm sorry. Uh, so what has been validly done cannot be called in question. The, the major, the minority, the four judges said no. Whether it's valid or invalid, you can't question. Then, of course, uh, Parliament immediately reacted to that and brought in this section 22 of the interpretation, interpretation ordinance. So it all depends on the exact wording of the interpretation uh, of the ouster clause and also how it's interpreted. It much will depend on all that. So that means that you, when you come to court, you must come in utmost good faith. So that would also would mean that uh, it is also very often we hear, hear state council coming and saying that the petitioner is not, has not come with clean hands. So in other words, you must, uh, if, if you firstly, you have to disclose everything to court. Uh, so even in your in your petition, if you try to suppress uh, matters, uh, if you if uh, sometimes we have we might think if something is a disadvantage to us, it is better not to tell the court that. But it is actually better to explain to the court, better to explain what you have to say, and uh, rather than trying to hide it from the court because eventually the court is anyway go, uh, going to know that. Then similarly, if you misrepresent matters, if you have, uh, uh, if you fail to disclose the material, uh, ma material facts which the court ought to know, but if you, if the, your conduct is such that you have not come to court in good faith, then your your application might be uh, dismissed on the grounds that you have not acted in utmost good faith. Sir, it's being discretionary. On, on what grounds will the issuance of a writ be denied? One is right. suppression. The other grounds, sir. Yeah, so, so uh, one is suppression, misrepresentation. Then also yeah. lashes, yes. uh, unexplained delay. Now, uh, very often, the now unlike a fundamental rights application, fundamental rights application, there is a specific time constraint. Yes. Every one month. Yes. But in writs, what is said is reasonable time. So, of course, what is reasonable time is a question also of fact. And also, I must say, very subjective because it would also depend on the judge who hears the matter, whether he thinks that time is reasonable or not. Uh, so, we have had cases where uh, if you can explain your delay, if you can explain your delay, sometimes the court, court might well accept that uh, that delay was reasonable. So, lashes means unreasonable, unexplained delay. So if you are if you are late to go to court, you must explain why you delayed. And sometimes, uh, well, we uh, there are uh, parties who think that merely if you keep on writing letters, you can explain that by your because your last letter is dated two weeks ago. So then your delay is explained. That is not good enough. You there must be something reasonable uh, to explain you know, explain why you did not come to court earlier. Then also, of course, there are reasons. Uh, for instance, if you have waived, if there is waiver or acquiescence, if there is in a certain matter, you have accepted uh, or acted upon, uh, given the other party the impression that you have acted up, uh, you are acting upon what the other party has done, that you have accepted it, then you might not be able to later on come to court and say uh, and challenge it. Again, uh, sometimes court can refuse uh, refuse to exercise its discretion on the grounds of public policy. So the court might look at something and see that the order, uh, if it gives such an order, it might be contrary to public policy. Court could also look at uh, the consequences. So for example, you seek to strike down a circular. Technically, the circular might be either ultra-virus or the circular might have been um, uh, effected uh, contrary to the principles of natural justice, so on. But if the if it has far-reaching consequences on th hundreds and thousands of people, then court might uh, 
not exercise it's a discretion uh, then there are certain instances where if they, you find that the petitioner has come with a bad motive with an ulterior motive then again the court could refuse to exercise its discretion dr sunil kure sir yes duty of legitimate expectation in writ applications what is yes. the difference between procedural and substantive legitimate expectation yeah and is, yes. Sorry. Yes, sorry. yes sorry yes yes sir uh, legitimate expectation is that you have an expectation that uh, uh, first of all that you will be heard in, in before a person exercises power which will, which might hurt you that you have an expectation that you would be heard for instance uh, if some indication has been given please don't do this until i am heard and he says yes i will hear you before i exercise power against you but he does not exercise but he does not allow you to make your submissions or to be heard then that's a violation of the the reasonable or the legitimate expectation that a party can have it was originally restricted to the right to be heard the legitimate expectation was restricted to the right to be heard but later on it has now been extended the legitimate expectation as to how power is to be exercised that is to say for instance uh, that you have an expectation that for instance if i may give an example uh, you are squatting on a certain land government land then there is a there is a uh, what is called a land cutchery to alienate that land to a suitable person then the person in occupation who is a squatter he makes an application and maybe some other persons also make applications now the person in possession has a legitimate expectation that he will be given priority that his application will be considered more favorably than the applications of those who are not in possession then that is uh, but if the pradhi or if the divisional secretary uh, accepts the application of some other person who is not in the position then uh, that is a that is a, a violation of his reasonable expectation and that can be attacked uh, in a writ application or in a fundamental rights application in fact there is a case on this point uh, i think it is reported in 64 new law reports uh, justice alasus judgment in Kasim Hamidu Lebbe versus Samoon. Kasim Hamidu Lebbe versus Samoon. Where I think even before the concept uh, came up uh, from the English law, Justice uh, Justice Alice has referred to reasonable expectation. I think the same 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 meaning, reasonable or legitimate. So I mean that's the idea. That is that the person is expecting reasonably expecting that power will be exercised, especially now discretionary power. Will be exercised in a certain way, but is not exercised in that way, then there is a violation of his reasonable or but but is now normally used as legitimate expectation. As the law in regard to legitimate expectation evolved over the years. Oh yes, as I said, it has evolved from originally being restricted to the right to be heard to the manner in which power is exercised. I mean the, the example I gave, you can I think. Uh, Our young lawyers can read uh, this book, this this this, this case. It, it's a nice case to read about reasonable expectation. Of course, Justice Alice at that time, the 1960s, the phrase used was not legitimate expectation. Justice Alice said the it referred to reasonable expectation. Those are the facts that I gave you. There is a person who was already in possession, was a squatter. He had built up his. Uh, uh, he had built up his. Uh, uh, house uh, and he has improved the property and uh, because somebody is known to the pradesh lekam he was given preference and he got the permit not the man in possession then the other person who got the permit sued him in the district court you have no right get out but then he said no i have a reasonable expectation and the his his reasonable expectation at that time for reasonable if not legitimate expectation was upheld by justice alas and justice alas said that uh, the grant of the permit to that other party not the person in possession was all wrong so can it has evolved have, in that way here yeah. so, yeah can you have a legitimate expectation against the state yes of course state officers 
can give uh, assurance that they'll be heard before some power is exercised. And if that is violated, of course, state meaning the state officers and uh, state authorities, you can. And if they exercise power, now, for instance, the example I gave you, Kasim Hamidu Lebe versus Samoon, I think it was reported in 64 in LI, if I'm, if I'm, not, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, or 63 in LI, that about. Now, there are the powers exercised by the uh, DRO, that is the Divisional Revenue Office, who is today represented by the, who is today the Divisional Secretary. So that's the state. So certainly you have a legitimate expectation of what Alice called, just as Alice called, reasonable, uh, legitimate expectation, or reasonable expectation. Yeah. Mr. Davis, sir, can a power to be granted not really not prayed for? So this is this question came up uh, actually in a matter which uh, uh, which I happen to uh, um, argue before uh, Justice Ajunobe Sekra. There the state council cited the case of uh, in 2003 3 SLR at 35. That is of course a civil case called Surani versus Rodrigo. In that, in that case, the court uh, had held the Court of Appeal that unless you have prayed for a particular, you asked for something, you prayed for it, that a party is not entitled to, uh, for, the court cannot give relief, which is not prayed for. However, in writ applications, the court has said that you, it is true that your court cannot give what is prayed for, but you can grant uh, the prayer in a all but in a modified form so so if we say the court the asked the court asked the uh, petitioner asked for certiorari in a particular form the court might still decide to issue certiorari but in a modified manner so the case of the, which was cited was also this uh, the case, chief minister's case it's called premachandra versus dodangoda premachandra and another versus dodangoda and uh, montague jai vikrama in this that case, the uh, court, the court of appeal, in granting relief, uh, the writ of mandamus modified the mandamus which was sought. So now, in this particular case, SCFR, uh, sorry, uh, CEA application four hundred three of twenty nineteen, uh, Justice Obey Sekara modified the relief which was sought. This was in relation to a school admission. The uh, court modified the relief which was sought. And because the court did not want to quash the entire circular on the basis that its repercussions would be great, but uh, Justice Obey Sekri issued what he called was a certiorarified mandamus. And uh, the effect of the mandamus would be in respect of the particular petitioner that that circular would not apply in that form. And he issued a mandamus uh, to, uh, for the child to be admitted to the school. So uh, I think that in writ applications, it is possible whether for the court to uh, fashion the relief, to modify the relief which is sought. But it is always safe to see, to, to think through and to see what are the reliefs you want and to include those reliefs because otherwise you, you get into unnecessary, the state council will come and argue that this relief is not prayed for and then uh, the, you will spend a lot of time. But I must say, I, I just want to point this out that in, in the uh, I, I have seen in the United Kingdom, uh, there, there are times when the court first decides to grant judicial review. And then that it goes on to the next step to decide what are the, once the court has decided whether there are grounds for judicial review, then as to what are the relief, uh, reliefs that could be granted in judicial review. So I, I really think that is important because otherwise, when uh, maybe at the start of the case, it would parties cannot exactly come to the conclusion what are the reliefs sought. So uh, perhaps we should Sri Lanka our courts also should look at whether the granting of uh, in fit in a fit case whether you should first decide that this is a case which merits the granting of review and then goes on to fashion out what relief should be granted. So in, I noticed this in the Brexit case. In the in the uh, in the United Kingdom, this is how the court moved. We are first in, decided to grant judicial review, then went on to the next step of deciding what exact reliefs ought to be granted. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Dr. Sunil Kure, sir. Yeah. What are the instances in, the, in which one can be proportionality? Well, proportionality, I believe, is uh, something to do with reasonableness. And uh, uh, my, uh, my recollection is that our courts have also introduced the concept of proportionality to say some reason. For instance, a person has been found guilty of an offense uh, while he was a worker, he was charged, charged with it. Now, supposing the offense that he found guilty of is not such a serious matter as to warrant his dismissal, then uh, if he is dismissed for the violation or the offense that he has, the minor offense he has committed, and he convinces the court that the punishment of dismissal from service is disproportionate to the offense that he had committed, then he will be granted relief. So proportionality is much to do with reasonableness. Has the principle of proportionality evolved in Sri Lanka? Uh, well, it has been introduced in several cases in Sri Lanka. I cannot, I think uh, maybe Mr. Piris might be able to uh, say something about this, but I, I have no recollection of it being evolved in any particular way. Uh, but I think it's been introduced in Sri Lanka. It has been, been used, it has been uh, put into operation in our country, saying that it's unreasonable. And Sir Shirai has issued on that ground. I came across one matter in a, a case of the dismissal of a chairman of, a, of the Valley Gama Pradesh Sabha. The court uh, took the position that he, well, he, he there was an inquiry held. He was found guilty of certain charges, but uh, the charges were very trivial charges. Uh, and uh, so the court said on grounds of proportionality that removing uh, him from uh, office was excessive. So, uh, Mr. Pires, rich being discretionary on the respondents. Sorry, respondent. Yeah, so I think, uh, firstly. The, you have to name the party. Uh, in RITS, it's very important to remember that you have to ensure that necessary that necessary parties have to be made named as respondents. So, firstly, the persons who are responsible for the decision, or the if, if it's a, if it's in the case of a mandamus, if you are wanting someone to perform a public duty, the authority which is responsible for performing that public duty or has failed to perform that public duty. If it's a co warrant if you're seeking uh, to challenge a person holding public office, you have to na uh, name that person. So it is very important to identify the person, firstly, the persons who are responsible for the decision you're seeking to quash or for the for whose uh, failure you're seeking to go seek a mandamus on, on one hand. Then secondly, you have to also name as respondents all those who would be affected by the, if the court gives an order in your favor, who are the persons who would be affected by that order? Now, I think in the, there was a case of uh, the University of Columbia. Uh, I think it was a uh, was a, a, a Stan, I Stanley Vijay Sundara and the University of Columbia. In there, what happened was the sir, the, the petitioners failed to name certain students who would be affected. If the court gave an order in favor of the petitioner, there would be others affected. And they were not named as parties, and they are persons who would have been affected by the order. So they, they ought to be heard by the court. So they were not made parties. So on the basis that necessary parties are not before court, court dismissed the, the application. So you must name as respondents all those who could be affected, who would be affected if the court decides in your favor. And of course, the persons concerned whose orders you're seeking to challenge. And there also we must remember that uh, you we, we have to be careful because in, in mandamus cases, uh, sometimes an objection is taken that you can seek a mandamus only against a natural person and not against a, a, a corporate, a, a body corporate. 
uh, there are uh, again there are different decisions of the court of appeal but it is so you you have to be conscious so sometimes it may be uh, ideal to name the person uh, uh, person holding office you might have to na name him uh, give his name and uh, his office especially where when it comes to when you seek a writ of mandamus so have the court, court of appeal changed its rules regarding naming of respondents whether it should be by name there was a move to do that was that done or I think public officers, I think public, uh, there, there is a provision that uh, in application under section 100, under article 140, that public officers could be uh, named by office. But there again, you need to be rather careful because there, 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 are, there are some judgments which say mandamus, you need to, uh, there, it must be against a natural person. I personally, I, I think sometimes we are too uh, the we are too involved in these technicalities, and uh, I must say I think the respondents also very often take up uh, these technical objections, whereas the real purpose must be you must look at the the justice of the case and try to do justice because that is what the constitution envisages. Is there anything you all would like to add? So, is there anything you would like to add? I mean, uh, oh, yes, relevant yeah, uh, topics, sir. Dr. Korea and Mr. Piri. Yeah, yes. I think uh, now regarding, regarding delay, regarding delay, I think. Uh, I think there are some authorities which say that delay does not really count if you, what, what you're complaining of is an invalid exercise of a ultra wire. There are some judgments to that effect. It's it's totally totally totally. Yes. Okay. And I think, uh, as Sali said, okay. I think there's rule five of the Court of Appeal rules, Supreme Court Court of Appeal procedure rules, uh, which are only regarding uh, public, uh, public uh, officers. Only public officers, like for instance, the divisional secretary or the minister secretary or whoever. But it doesn't catch up with people like, say, the chairman of the UDA or, let's say, the minister in charge and yes. so on. So we find sometimes that ministers change all too often. So then you can, you've got to keep on changing, bringing the new name. You just can't say minister of lands or whoever. So I think that's also something to be changed. It should be changed, I think. I would like to also add uh, to what uh, Dr. Kure said. Uh, there is this, uh, the case of Justice Sharwan and the Bisomani covers a serial yes. somewhere That's in 1982 right. SLR where he said so that even if there is a long delay, yes. if the act complained of is totally beyond authority, the, uh, the authority of the uh, person who uh, committed that act, then in such a case, uh, you might be able to overcome delay. Uh, another principle of uh, on delay lashes, there are judgments of Justice Mark Fernando, where he point, uh, says that it should not be the court which takes up the objection as to delay. That it must be a party which takes up the or takes the objection as to delay, and it, uh, he had frowned upon the court uh, taking uh, taking up the objection as to delay. Yeah. Uh, also, I think in writ applications. Uh, again, the judgment of the Supreme Court from Justice Mark Fernando, he has brought in this concept of even in relation to mandamus. Normally, mandamus requires a public duty, public statutory duty. The duty must emanate from statute. But Justice Mark Fernando has coupled it with Article 12.1 of the Constitution and says that because there is the equal protection of the law in 12.1, that that in itself might give rise to a public duty to act according to law. I think uh, Mr. Salih Piris, President's Council, has brought out a very important case uh, where he cites uh, judgment of Justice uh, Janak, is it, uh, no, sorry, Arjuna Obesekara regarding certiorari verified mandamus. Is it a reported case or not yet? We don't think it is reported, sir, as yet. It's, uh, it was 2019. 
Oh, I see. Uh, delivered in 2020, 403 of 2019. In fact, it related right. to, to a school admission. And I the see. petitioner was a lawyer who was uh -huh. seeking school admission for his son. Son, uh -huh. right, right. But I think this is a very important development in the law. Yes. Uh, that is, even if you fail to pray for the quashing of something, yes. uh, that can be disregarded because it's not valid. And you can issue mandamus saying it's a certiorari fight mandamus. That is, it's yes. certiorari is also sort of within it. I think that's the idea, yes. Yes, and uh, but it does not, it, the court does not venture to cause the circular because it might have repercussions on others. Yes. But in respect of the petitioner, that the uh, uh, circular would not be ap applicable. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It was informative and helpful and it augurs well for a very productive discussion. Over to you, Asil. Um, on behalf of the tutory, I would like to thank Dr. Sunil Kure and Mrs. Talia Peris, President's Council, for taking time out of your busy schedule to share your legal expertise in the field of administrative law. I believe our students have greatly benefited from this panel discussion. I would like to thank our two moderators, Ms. Tushani Machado, Mrs. Faiza Maka, for helping us moderate this on such short notice. I would also like to thank our working com our committee for helping us organize this as well. Uh, so good evening and thank you once again. <laughs>